So Seamus, I hear that you're just about to quit forever your apartment and move into a real house. Yes, in fact, the move be this episode goes up on Monday and the move is the day immediately after. Um, so this is just a heads up to everybody. Please don't start a fire in the comments. I'm going to be off the internet for a lot of Tuesday and probably be in a bad way the rest of the week and in the middle of this chaos. So, I'm going to try and make content this week, but we'll see how it goes. So it's going to be like no internet for a month or something nowadays? <laughs> how long does that take? Hopefully just a day. Hopefully less than a day. You get turned off on one place, turned on, on the, in the new place. Oh, it's this big chain of stuff that has to happen. The new place, the it has a modern fuse box and modern outlets, but the wiring between the two hasn't been updated since 1960, and they're not properly grounded. Oh no! So, and I I use a a UPS universal power supply, you know, uh, uninterrupted power supply. I'm sorry. So, you know it. You know, battery backup. It's that's just to save my computer from brownouts, which I've been getting a lot. You know, we we started getting brownouts. They they only last a few seconds, but you know, I'm like, oh, those are bad for computers. So I get this uninterrupted yeah. power supply, but the, its alarm howls if you were to plug it into <laughs> a non-grounded outlet, and you you know you can press this button and hold it, and it'll turn the alarm off for five minutes. That's largely impractical <laughs> long term. So, yeah, I it must be some sort of federal regulation because everything when the power goes out, this power supply, and in fact all of them I've bought, how just constant alarm, all the time when the power's off. But there's a button to disable it for five minutes. It's ridiculous. Like I don't need you to make this constant ear splitting noise all the time that's crazy why 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 can't i turn that off permanently i don't need that feature <laughs> well i mean you don't need it. it ostensibly it's there so that when the power actually goes down for like a week or whatever you need to shut down your systems nicely and so it's like hey the power's out for real start shutting things down right but you know that feature makes no sense to me. It doesn't. It's just like, <laughs> oh, like good. I have uninterrupted power, so I can continue to work while the power's out. Except I can't continue to work because I'm being driven from the room with this audio assault. So stupid. I'll bet uh, if you get Isaac on it, he can pull that thing out. You just clip the wires. Probably. Um. Anyway. So we had, that whole aside was like, oh, well, we need to do this and then we need to get the wiring fixed. You know, we have somebody coming in to do the wiring. And then after that, we need the Internet hooked up. And it's this whole chain of things that have to happen at the right time in the right order while we're busy moving in. So it's going to be bonkers all week. And I have appointments, meeting with contractors and stuff. So I'm going to try and make some content for you folks this week. But. We'll, we'll see how that goes, and if I'm able to. So, speaking of video games... Yes. Um, so last week, um, I wrote that post about, you know, Sony... I, I guess this, all of these, all the companies are doing these little, you know, live streams. Instead of having E3 this year, everybody's just going to live stream it, which... That's great. You know, spread it out a little. Give give each presentation a few days so that we don't have this just this one week of flood of information and then, you know, go back to no new news this week. You know, it's nicer on everybody. But we had the Sony PlayStation event where they showed off 25 games and then a couple days ago, there was the EA Play event where they showed off a handful of games. You know, and they're getting us excited about games coming out in 2021. And I'm like, this is really silly. They're asking me to get excited about 
games for 2021 when there are a bunch of games for 2020 that have all been delayed. And <laughs> right. <laughs> like those have got to come out first. <laughs> they don't even have release dates yet. Uh, the games in twenty twenty one. Yeah. Well, the, what? The ones in the ones that they're re they're they're hyping right now don't have release dates, or the no, ones, the ones that, that are supposed delayed. To, yeah, yeah, the ones that they've delayed, like Watch Dogs Legion, Bloodlines Two. There's a couple other oh, games. No. I, they don't. They're they're escaping me at the moment. But there was like four games that I was really looking forward to. Oh, Kerbal Space Program Two. And there's oh, one more. Yeah. But I, and they're all delayed. Some of them by a lot. And they don't even have release dates. It's not like oh, this is pushed back until you know August or whatever. Still, I got a I got a promotion a uh, a marketing email today from from the publisher of Bloodlines 2, and it's like, oh, here, you know, we have the, what do you call it, the Ultimate Edition or the Collector's Edition, you know, it's between one and two hundred dollars, and it comes with a bunch yeah, of yeah. plastic Yeah, Armageddon crap. box. Right. And I'm like, you, you're trying to sell me this hundred dollar version of the game, or two hundred, I don't know, it had a lot of stuff in it. Um... But you still don't have a release date. What is going on? <laughs> like, why would I pre-order a game that does not have any perceived... It's not like... It's not even like, oh, fall of 2020. No idea. No idea when this is coming out. And there's nothing to guarantee that it's... Um, that it's going to come out this year. Maybe it's been postponed to 2021 and we'll just get double the normal amount of games in 2021. But every yeah, time it's one of be these like the only February ever where there's like a hundred games released. Right. And every time a game got de delayed, you know, Watch Dogs or, or Kerbal Space Program or Bloodlines 2, every time I ran into one of those delays, I was like, okay, that sucks. I was looking forward to that, but hey, Cyberpunk 2077 is still coming. I've got that. I just got to make it to September. And then I'll have, you know, I can play Cyberpunk for the rest of the year. I'll be good. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. what I did with Witcher. I, Witcher, man, that thing lasted weeks, maybe even months. Um, so I'm good. But then last week, Cyberpunk got delayed. From September to November. Man. So, Wait, now, just nothing. when in November? I don't remember. I want to say 19th. Because that's like right around the end of the world, right? Right. So, this is much sadness, and I really, like, have nothing to play. Like, I'm sort of groping around, all right, look through my backlog, look through all this, and it's like... Well, there's some games, but there's nothing I've been looking forward to or meaning to look at or get back to. And, you know, I need crap to write about. <laughs> this year sucks. Yeah. I mean, I, I realize that delayed games is not the worst news this year. <laughs> not by a long shot. But um, it sucks anyway. Yeah, especially when it would be nice to have a distraction from, you know, yeah. things going wrong. Especially, I, it's so weird that all these games got delayed and then we had that quarantine for months and it's like people stuck inside with nothing to do and all the games have been delayed. And it's like somebody missed an opportunity here. <laughs> there was a money... <laughs> no, matter, no matter what your game was, if you just put it out in like, you know, April, it would have been golden. Oh well. That's the bad news. But how about you, Paul? You don't have any bad news, do you? No, uh, everything's great here. Um, water heater broke, lost my job, and uh, my whole family left me. They're they're gone now. I mean, they're they haven't gone very far, but they went to some place with a water heater. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they went. They went to my son. We went to a birthday party, but um. 
yeah, it was laid off. I mean, it's kind of a one of those things where it's like, yeah, it makes sense, and it's certainly not uh, not a unique situation that I find myself in. There's no thousands is this a and thousands, probably millions of people that are that are out of work right now. Right. Is this a permanent layoff, like, or is this just, hey, we need a few months, we'll call you back, and and. Or is this just your uh, this job I, I is think over? It was a, I think it was a permanent layoff of like, we're we're going a different direction and, and uh, glad you're here, but go find something else to do, so. That's terrible. Yeah, it's, I wasn't very happy at it and I learned a lot uh, from, you know, working there. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to where this goes in the future. I mean, it's, it's an opportunity. It's always a there's always a way to look in the bright side of it, but yeah, it's it's depressing and stressful, and you know we've got a family to feed, and uh, but it's not it's not all bad, and and really there's a lot to be that I have to be grateful for, like all the the help that I've got from family and friends and uh, stuff like that. So I I'm doing fine, but uh, yeah, some bad news. Well, good luck. I hope everything turns out all right for you. Yeah, me too. And, you know, uh, my wife and I were saying to each other, man, at least we've still got our health. Like, that's that's really, really nice to not be, like, dying or whatever. Um, how are you Speaking doing? of that, <laughs> yeah. So, um, way back before quarantine, I went to see the doctor. Just the, year, you know, the yearly checkup. You know, he kicks the tires, make sure I'm fit to be walking around on my own. And, uh... <laughs> They took my blood pressure and and the doctor was like, "You know, this is this is borderline hypertension. You you your blood pressure is a little high. I mean, you know, it's not really it's not outrageous, but you really should think about trying to lose a little weight and um, you know, maybe get some more exercise and and try and cut the salt out of your diet." And I'm like, "Oh, yeah, that's all reasonable. That's stuff I've been meaning to do anyway." This was like three months ago or whatever. And then the quarantine happened. And that resulted in me getting way less exercise. I just sort of stayed inside. I, I normally walk a few miles a week, you know, just go out and walk for a mile a couple times a week. No big deal. Not, not like super exercisey, but you know, some movement. During quarantine, sure. I active. did not leave the house. Yeah. And I ate nothing but salty starches, just absolute garbage food. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I actually, oh. and I didn't, and it was so slow. I didn't realize I had a problem until it was time to leave the house, you know, a couple weeks ago. And I went to put on my jeans, which like last year I'd lost all this weight and they were falling down on me. I'm like, oh man, I'm going to need to get smaller pants. And now I could barely button them. And I'm like, oh no, this got bad quick. Yikes. So, so then a few days ago, I was just feeling awful. Like kind of a little bit dizzy, spots in front of my eyes. Felt sort of muddle-headed and just off. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And after like wandering around the house trying to figure it out, uh, Heather's like, let me take your blood pressure. And it was 185 over 125. Whoa. Yeah. And I didn't know what that meant. I was like, oh, I've never seen it that high before. Is that bad? Oh, that is, like, that... <laughs> yeah. And you need to sit went... down, except that would raise your blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then I looked it up online to get some sort of context. And, it, and I was like, oh, it's over. Okay, over 90 is bad. Oh, over 100 is really bad. Oh, over 120 is like, this is a medical emergency. You should consider going to the hospital. <laughs> you are dangerously close to getting a high score at blood pressure. <laughs> Seamus, no. So I realize, and it's like every, I, I looked at several sites just to make sure, you know, internet medical sites aren't super reliable. So I, I read several of them to sort of get a second opinion. And they were all like, serious risk of stroke or heart attack. And read the next one. Serious risk of stroke or heart attack. I was like, huh, this might be serious. 
So this is instant, like, go into panic mode, instant lifestyle change, get more exercise, cut out all the, you know, change my entire diet. I had to get rid of my salt lick. Um, <laughs> so, um... I've gotten out, I've gotten my blood, it only took a couple days and my blood pressure is already out of the dangerous cr crisis, you know, go to the emergency room level. And now I've got it all the way down to where I'm just stage two hypertension. Oh, man. <laughs> so it's going to be an interesting summer. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to get a bike. We have a, a bike trail near us. And this is something I wanted to do anyway, is just start biking. Yeah. So, Listen to so, podcasts. Oh, that's a good idea. Actually, my wife uh, wants to go with me, so she 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 wants me to, even, even before I got sick, she wanted to do that because she wants to hang out with me. And I mean, I want to hang out with her too. I, I don't want to make it sound like I don't, but like that's you know. Like, this would be kind of like a date for her. Let's go on the trail. So, big lifestyle changes coming after this move, assuming I don't have a heart attack during the move. Oh, man. So, that's exciting. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Kind of feeling like maybe I could have spent that quarantine time a little better. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I've actually um, struggled with low blood pressure. It, it kind of runs in the family. and uh, so Heather, the, too. Okay, yeah. So, so like, it was kind of nice just, you know, sit, sit around and not have to do too much exercise. And But, yeah, it's probably not good for my health either. Right. Yeah, that's pretty... Do you normally run a lower than temperature than most people? Um, yeah, actually, my, my body temperature is a little bit lower. It's like 97.8, I think. Heather's the same way. I wonder if the two are related. Huh. Yeah. Well, if you're not using your salt lake, you could send it over to me, I guess. Or I'll just give it to Heather. <laughs> right. Oh, she, she already eats super healthy. She's one of those people that's blessed with the ability to enjoy a salad. And mm. I am not. And I'm just... Yeah, I, I mean, don't like salads I, either. Right. I mean, I, I just absolutely went crazy with eating during... The, I don't even know why. I knew it was a bad idea. But, you know, sugar tastes good. So I was, like, having really bad stuff, like bags of chips and donuts and just, you know, anything that could get lodged in my heart and prevent it from beating, I think. <laughs> just... Uh, Open me up for no the autopsy. Argument, though. It's right. so good. Right? <laughs> Open me up for the autopsy after I die and they'll just find a jelly donut inside of my heart. <laughs> just wedged in there. Oh, man. Well, take good care of yourself, Seamus. You gotta, gotta keep this, this site going for another few years at least. At least, yeah. I wanna get a little... I wanna... Uh, I want to get at least another month out of it, just to just to justify the hosting costs I've paid ahead of time. It'd be a shame <laughs> if I died now and that went to waste. You gotta make it till Cyberpunk, right? I really do. Yeah. So, so what are you playing in the meantime? Well, you, there's nothing yeah. else to do. There's nothing else to do, and I was like, went through my Steam library. Nothing that interested me. And look through GOG. A couple of things I've been meaning to play, but I just wasn't in the mood for any of them. And then I opened up... Things got so desperate, I opened up Origin, EA's launcher. And I'm like, oh, wow. It's like, you know you're in trouble when you open up Origin on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> it has come to this. <laughs> Here we are. But then I saw in, I, you know, they, they have free games for subscribers or whatever. I forget how it works. But one of them was Opus Magnum. 
And oh. I remember... Have you never you, played Opus Magnum? I have never played it when you visited me. How long ago was that? About a year ago or something? Yeah, it was um, like over two years ago, I think. Oh, wow. Where does the time go? Um, he, you, you actually showed me the game and you were really, really positive about it. And I was like, cool. And I sort of put it on my mental list to get. But I never like paid for it. But then I got it for free, and <laughs> oh, I was like, "I'm, I'm not really in the mood for a puzzle game." But Paul said this was really good, so I'll try it. And that's basically all I've done for the last day. Wow, is this a good game? Oh my goodness, <gasps> do I love this game! Oh, I'm so happy. It is so, it is so good. Opus Magnum. For those who have not played it, it's, you know, supposedly you're doing alchemy. But what you're really doing is building a little machine to arrange pieces. So, you know, it's it's a puzzle game where you've got some grabber arms to move objects around. And you need to move them into the right positions and connect them to each other. You know, imagine automating a couple of arms to pick up an object, move it in proximity to this object, rotate it in the right position, and put it down where it goes, without any of the pieces like getting in each other's way or colliding. That's the game. Now, That's all there is to it. Yeah, and most games, most games would have like, here's your inputs, and here's the spot for your outputs. And the puzzle would be how to get it from here to there. Opus Magnum leaves the entire board blank. You decide where the inputs go, and you decide where the outputs go. And that really tickles my brain, because it makes it so open-ended. And that's what I think pushes it from feeling like a regular puzzle game to, like, you compared it to programming. And I really got a feel for that. Like, this, you're deciding, you're not just trying to solve the puzzle, you're deciding how the puzzle will be solved. And Right, uh, right. Oh, it's not like, that, here's a thing. Well, you played Space Chem, right? Uh, a little bit. I didn't, I didn't beat it, but I played some of it, yes. And it's, it's kind of a, an, another iteration of that, more or less. Except that being able to reconfigure the board, and the board is infinite too, right? Like it's it's not bounded. So you've got this right. whole space to play in. And like you said, you decide everything about how this is going to go. And then it's just like, oh, what? It When you have a fixed board, it suggests to you a solution. But with the yep. board completely open, it's like you're on your own. It's the feeling you get when you design your own API. It's like... Oh, coming up with the overall structure is my responsibility. And that open-ended means that you can do a bad job of, de of designing it on a conceptual level. And the thing that really sells it for me is when you beat the puzzle, it gives you those three ratings of how much space did you use, how many cycles did you, basically how long did it take, and how much area... How many cycles? Oh, and the other play, the other one is how many parts did you use? Yeah. And those three together kind of map nicely to like, you know, designing a program that has a low memory footprint or runs really fast or, you know, um, runs efficiently or something. Right, right. And you can design something sort of sprawling and just cobbled together and disorganized that gets the job done. But when you get done, you're like, whoa, this could be done twice as fast. And there's a little histogram showing you, you know, oh, wow, very, very few people got it done as fast as possible. I wonder if I can do that. So then the, the puzzle sort of yeah. encourages you, but not requires you to optimize it. And you can't. You can't usually optimize all three things. You optimize for one or two of the three. You know, okay, you can make it run yeah. super fast, but, you know, it's going to have a huge footprint because you're going to need lots of parts or whatever. 
So I absolutely love Opus Magnum. As soon as this diecast is done, I'm going right back into it. It's really good. No, oh, I'm glad you got into it. It's yeah. He he um Zach does a really a really good job with his games. I I've, I've been impressed by a lot of his stuff. Yeah, this game is something special. So what have you been up to? Um, well, I've been mostly playing for jobs and stuff, but um, when right, I get to obviously. playing some games, uh, it's been Noida again. Just kind of, just kind of cruising on the Noida train. Isn't the game still in early access? Yeah, they uh, they've got a new um, new beta release. I think if you got it on Steam, you got it on Steam, right? I did. Yeah, see, I got it on. Uh, you told me this was going to happen, but. I got it on GOG, and there's no way to get access to the beta releases on GOG, so I'm kind of sitting on my hands just waiting and playing the old version. But there's a new version out on the beta release in, in Steam, and uh, yeah, they're still working on it. I, I don't know if they even have a roadmap for when it's going to be released, you know, complete. But it's certainly very playable now, and, and uh, a good time. Cool. What say... We do some mailbags. All right. All right. Dear Diecast, I recently finished a game that had a very deliberately shocking twist cliff slash cliffhanger. Okay. Uh, Tim here describes the game. It's 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 good. You should read his his um, letter. It will be in the show notes if you're curious, but I'm going to jump to the question at the end. Have you guys been turned off by a, or turned off of a game by a very badly telegraphed blam cliffhanger? If not in an earlier installment, maybe in promotional material. And if so, did you eventually give in and check the game out anyway, or did you stick to your guns and leave it alone? Vale, Tim. So I have one for this. Go for I, it. Nothing springs immediately to mind. I... The, the most frustrating ending for me was this dream... Is it Dreamfall? Sequel to The Longest Journey? The end of that mm. was just... All the main characters are dead or defeated. Okay, this is like... Ultimate terrible ending. Everything failed. And, you know, this is a long game. You worked... You went through all this, you solved these puzzles, you went on this adventure, and at the end, it's just everything is as bad as possible. And, you know, major characters, even characters from the first game, are just dead in terrible ways. <laughs> no. And it's a setup for a sequel. And I knew there wasn't going to be, it like, it took this game, like, a decade to come out. Like, Dreamfall, it took Dreamfall... A long time to come out after the longest journey. I knew this was not a studio. They just had that was just gonna, you know, crank out games. This this cliffhanger was to keep people interested so they'd want the sequel. But it's like I'm not gonna sit around for eight years and wait till the end of this to find out how this turned off turned out. And it just made me angry. And there is another game in the series now, and I haven't looked at it. Like, I just completely lost all interest in the series. And I just, every time I see it, I just think, um, sort of deliberately bleak, sadistically awful ending that makes you feel empty and, you know, ma makes it feel like nothing you did mattered. And that's the, the feeling I got from the game. I hated it. And I still, I'm still angry at it. Oh, so, man. That's, yeah. I don't play a lot of story-focused games. And uh, I, I like to play more like puzzle games or, or like engineer-y kind of, uh, you know, sandbox games and things like that. And so I, I don't really have a, a, a feel for this. But I do know that in like... I don't know, web comics and stuff, um, when there's like the cliffhanger of the week or the cliffhanger of the month or whatever, or like they're just about to go on a sabbatical or something and they put up this big cliffhanger thing. It makes me feel like 
well, I don't know. Or, or like, or like novels too. It's, there's something about giving your audience a proper arc and tying things up before you, before you put it down and go on and do something else that just feels right. Polite, maybe. Right. Like I, I paid this money expecting a full experience and a story that ends on this downer note where where all the here like all the characters you care about all the main I'll just spoil it like all the main characters are either dead or in a coma and dying like what am I looking forward to here to see it's that's not a complete story unless it's just a shoot the shaggy dog story yeah so yeah I feel like it I feel like it's a very cynical thing to do. How can I make someone care about my game so they'll buy the sequel? Well, I'll just end this one horribly. But with the promise that, oh, if you come and buy another game, maybe that one will have a satisfying ending. Well, it, it has to be done artfully, right? Like, right. if you're going to go that way, then you can't just have, like, everyone is in mortal peril. What will happen next? There's no way out. And like, well, what, I'm going to pay like another 40 bucks for a deus ex machina? Like, that's not right. interesting. Right. So, yeah. I think it shows a lack of respect for the audience. Agreed. Dear DieCast, when are absurd video game body counts actually a problem? Uh, and he goes on, there's this whole thing, it'll be in the show notes, but... That's the main question. Yeah, so in some games, it's like, oh, this is ridiculous. Like, uh, the, the classic example is L.A. Noir, right? Like, <laughs> right? You're, you're supposed to be just this, you're supposed to be a cop. Just a regular cop, but you have a body count in the triple digits. Asking the hard-hitting questions, pulling the hard-hitting bullets. Right. And I think it's it's when you have a game setting that's too grounded, but you still want to offer to... Like, I never had a problem with Commander Shepard's body counts in Mass Effect. That was totally... Re, uh, you know, I don't know. It's the space future. Maybe it's normal that space future soldiers have to kill hundreds and hundreds of evil robots. That seems totally reasonable to me. That's his job. But yeah, uh, the L.A. Noir was very serious and very grounded. Everything else about it seemed grounded and almost like trying to make it mundane. Just the grunt of police work and interrogations. But then when it's combat time, it, it turns into, you know, Gears of War or whatever. And it just feels <laughs> too dissonant. Well, and aren't you investigating a murder? Right, yeah. So it's and like I, I, one person died, and you're going through all this trouble to try to figure out and blam, 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 you know, kill five people. Oh, now who could have done this? Blam, blam, kill three more people. It's like, okay, well, really, is this really actually something you're concerned about at this point? Cole, thank you for solving that murder. We have 500 more murders for you to figure out. <laughs> it looks like someone went bananas last week. Yeah, I agree <laughs> right? that probably the, the, whole, the whole setting uh, is really important to nail if you're going to have a lot of combat in your game. Right. And really, if you're going to have high body counts and very video gamey systems, then kind of make the world itself outright. Like, I never complained about killing absolutely thousands of people in Saints Row the Third. That's totally fine. That's, you know, it's a silly, absurd world. Yeah, yeah. And Pitch black slapstick humor world. It's like, sure, fits right in. Right. So I think you need to be careful with your tone. And the more seriously you the more melodrama and the more serious the drama is, the more you need to think about, should I be making this into a shooter or should I be making this 
into more of a dialogue-driven game. Hmm. Now the oh. the diecast questioner uh, asks here or suggests that pacing can be a solution to this, where if you have really good pacing and with a lot of downtime in between action segments, then it can make it not feel so ridiculous that these you know action things are happening. Right. I also think it helps to move the setting away from civilization. Like normal, everyday, ah, driving yeah. around in a normal city. But if it's post-apocalypse, or if you're, you know, like Nathan Drake is out in the wilderness. Well, you know, okay, it it's, it's implausible that one person could defeat a hundred enemies like that. But if we... But if we ignore that, it is plausible that if you were to get in gunfights and survive all the gunfights with hundreds and hundreds of mercenaries in the wilderness, that, you know, there's not going to be a police investigation afterwards. It's not going to cause you problems. Right? Right, right. It's removed from everyday life to a degree that allows you to make allowances for the ridiculous violence. Right, right. Post-apocalypse, sure, you can kill lots of people. There's no cops are going to show up. Nobody's going to show up and say, "Wow, where did all these dead bodies come from?" Um, yeah. So it'd be kind of funny to do a game where you're just like cleaning up after action set pieces. That's been done. Yeah, viscera cleanup detail. Oh, uh, it's that's a game right. Where yeah, I I always thought viscera cleanup detail would kind of missed the mark with its humor. I always thought it would be cool if you were obviously working for the bad guys, and you were and so you are coming through oh, and mopping yeah. up after after Duke Nukem has come through and killed everybody, but everything would be like humanizing the bad guys like they're gonna have taco tuesday in the break room and and they're talking about oh yeah you know our evil plans to take over the whole world and they're going really well this guy's not gonna stop us and have a great weekend everybody and that sort of that sort of just dissonance where you're cleaning up the evil bad guy lair after the hero right, blows right. through and you'd be you show sort up of to work on Monday, and you're like, "Oh man, another Monday." Right, and you'd be following in the wake of a hero. So the cleanup, the cleanup would get crazier and crazier, and the last level would be you cleaning up some horrendously enormous boss monster, you know, some <laughs> cyber dino thing or whatever. Like I think that would like be... all the traps are disarmed and all the bridges and doors are unlocked already. Right. Oh well. But it's still a funny idea for a game. Dear Diecast, since you guys like Factorio, I was wondering if you've seen the game Shapes with a Z dot IO, and if so, what your opinions are on it. The game has a GitHub and an itch.io page. Vale Tim. There will be links in the show notes to all of this, all of this stuff. Yeah, I played a bit of the game. It actually just runs in a browser window. If you're if you're down with that, it's like um, my it's like Factorio Lite. You can't uh, so as far as I've gotten in the game, you can't like have intersecting or you can't have your conveyor belts go around each other. Like have one go underground or bridge over others so it's not as interesting you can't the problems you face aren't excuse me aren't going to be as complex as factorio but it is sort of a nice sort of distillation of just that part of factorio i, I you enjoyed do later it get it, tunnel tunnel conveyors so you can cross them over oh nice nice yeah i really felt like the game was missing missing that um, yeah, it's an interesting game. If you just really like the conveyor belt portion of Factorio, then this is a pretty good game. And as far as I've played it, uh, 
you could play quite a bit. You can play for quite a while. The free version runs in a web window, so that's really cool. And it's very clean. The presentation is like super yeah. abstract and clean. Yeah, it's, you know, icon based as opposed to trying to look like a base in the desert or whatever. Hmm. Yeah, it reminded me almost of like origami or something. Right. Or whatever it is when you you can cut the paper. There's a there's a name for that too. Uh, is there? I always thought it was just origami, except you're allowed to cut the paper. Is there a special <laughs> word for that? That's interesting. Oh, I don't remember what it is. Dear Diecast, Standing Stone Games is at it again. They put out a coupon to make all their current non-expansion content in Lord of the Rings Online and DDO free forever for anyone who makes an account before August 31st. Pretty cool. And there's a link here. Jennifer Snow. Um, yeah, if you, if you, if you have not played the games, and I still, I recommend Lord of the Rings Online, and Jennifer Snow recommends Dungeons and Dragons Online, um, I really do think if you're, like, kind of burned on, on out on WoW, but you could use a, an MMO from that era, Lotro is a really good choice, and I still love it. I still think it's super charming. So getting all the stuff for free is really cool. I highly recommend if you're bored or looking for an old school MMO, try this. So thanks for the heads up, Jennifer Snow. Yeah, I, I think I need to get an account even if I don't play it because maybe my kids would be interested. Right. It really is super charming. I mean, uh, and here's the funny thing. A lot of the stuff I'm, I'm, I had a Let's Play years ago, and I made fun of a lot of early game content. And when I was doing that, they actually comped me a lifetime, you know, sub, a lifetime account. All DLC, no monthly fee, which was nice of them. Wow, but yeah. Th the stuff I made fun of has all been revamped. And I kind of wonder how much my series, how much impact, like how much of that was to do with me? Right. Was that, was that a response to me or was that just, uh, you know, kind of like what World of Warcraft doing? Oh, we need to freshen up the beginning of the game. A lot of the really silly stuff has been either removed or patched over. Oh, I'm so glad we have your your comic series to remind us of what it used to be like. Right. Oh, I, I still like. I mean, it's not often that an author can enjoy their own work, but I do enjoy reading that once in a while. I forget. I forget all my jokes, and then five years later, I read them again. I'm like, oh yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> Dear Diecast. Okay, this is long. I'm just gonna read the meat of it. To my surprise, Windows 7 keeps getting security updates, even though Microsoft said they've stopped supporting it. One day, I turned on my PC, started working, and I saw I had another Windows update. Neat, I thought, and clicked OK, and carried on working. About 10 minutes later, I was deep into looking at the remote client to my office computer. Suddenly, my machine froze, giving me a nonsense error. To, and then there's some rebooting and some shenanigans there. Do read this comment. It's it's a harrowing tale. To my relief, I quickly saw that this wasn't a request for reinstalling Windows. Phew, I thought. Yet my relief was quickly replaced with outrage because this whole blue white screen blue text was actually a new program, Microsoft Edge. Turns out the only purpose of this update was to install their obnoxious Windows 10 browser that I never asked for. And then we get to the question. What is the worst way a Windows update or decision has made you angry? Keep being awesome, Lino. So, um, I've got one for this. I think the, I, 
I don't know if it's the one that made me the most angry, but the one that was just sort of the most egregious failure was when I was trying to use the Windows 10 store to buy a game. And all I, w I needed to install this entire update just to get the store working. And after the update, the computer no longer under... The, the computer had evidently forgotten about half my memory. Like I had 16 gigabytes and it was like, you only have eight. And uh, the machine began... Oh, I forget. It was like locking up and doing all these horrible things and I had to roll it back. That was just sort of this baffling failure of like, how did it get this bad? Oh, man. Uh, uh, probably the one that made me the most angry is in the early days of Windows 10 when you could not really postpone updates. I'd be in the middle of working and it's like, it's time to update now. And your options were do it now or put it off for 10 minutes. And I know that happened to me a few times before they, before they give you the option to make the update sleep for five days. And I know I said a lot of swear words to my monitor when that happened. Because, you know... You're deep in concentration and you're working and now you have an unknown an interruption of unknown length and it's like I could have done this overnight and instead you're just gonna like take this big bite out of my work day oh I still get angry thinking about it although um, to be fair probably you were working overnight and you know computer doesn't know any better <laughs> right so what about you, Paul? You have any Windows horror stories? Um, it wasn't me directly, but I was working for a company that had a. It was like a, some sort of file sharing thing. It wasn't like, maybe it was Windows. I, I don't know all the details. The gist of it was that there was some sort of network file sharing system that integrated with, deeply with Windows, and there was a an error in Windows that caused, if you opened a, f there was like a certain file error of some kind, where if you opened the folder that had this file error, then your computer started behaving improperly. So it's basically like a virus, except it wasn't a malicious virus. It was just like a bug that was catching so that oh. you could, so you could get it. And Microsoft knew about it because um, the the company who was who was writing all this file sharing stuff had been working with them to like try to get a fix because like this is a big problem. So and, and it wasn't like it would corrupt your system or anything, but like every time you you clicked on a file or something, it would open a new um, a new Explorer window. So like you've got an Explorer window somewhere, and then like when you click on a file, it's just like wink, and it opens up another another window or maybe it would close the window I forget it was something really annoying having to do with a file browser and uh, right. so they knew about it and they were gonna patch it but it took them uh, over a year I think to to patch in a fix for it that would that actually worked and uh, over that whole period there was this this difficult problem of like okay this person has has peered into the corrupted knowledge of this file folder and so now their computer is like really difficult to use and so then you'd have to like wipe the system and reinstall everything to get it to not be broken but you still had that folder there and so like if if anyone needed to work on that thing then they just had to bite the bullet and like you know take this thing down but then they had to be really careful to not work on anything else because then it would also corrupt those folders. And so it was just like this crazy, this is crazy horrific nightmare that like just didn't get updated. And like, why didn't it? No one knows. Oh, you know, uh, we're running short this week instead of long. So instead of ending the show now, I will tell you a very similar story that I is <gasps> oh relevant boy relevant to what I'm doing now. One of our big plans for after the move is uh, Isaac and I, when we're producing videos, we need to share a lot of really big files. And 
we have to, what we've been doing is I upload them to Dropbox and then he downloads them. But that means I need to upload over the internet and then he downloads over the internet. And, you know, that <laughs> wastes right. it's internet. It's so dumb. Thing. You're in the same building, right? Right, right. And we're on the same network. So I was like, this is silly. What I should do is I should set up a file server computer, like a computer separate from mine that will host, you know, a bunch of files that we need to share. And I can dump the files. And since it's on a local network, it should be very quick. You know, it's just going through the router and not out to the internet. And same for him. And it should, you know, go as fast as the router allows instead of as fast as your internet connection allows when, you know, everybody else in the house is streaming Netflix and doing whatever, right? Sure. So I looked up, you know, how do I share files on Windows 10? And it was the worst answer. Okay. There's the home group feature that has recently been deprecated. And you're not supposed to use it anymore, but here's a hack to allow you to continue using it. And then here's the new way, although the docs are a little, you know, th there's no clear like, okay, well, how does this work? So there's the well-documented old way, and then there's the patchy new way, and there's no explanation for why it was changed. And I'm really freaked out because I can't tell what it's doing like okay i can have this computer share a drive that's what i want to do just this entire drive share it sure because you're not worried about security or whatever because but you're just sharing it with the family right but is that going to be visible to the internet is there can we put a password <laughs> on it do we need to i mean you know we're talking to the same router can what what is possible is there any security considerations I need to worry about? And I couldn't find anything. And it's all very vague on how it works and and how the other person finds the files. I mean, okay, I'm sharing it, but, you know, how do they find it? Where is it going to show up for them? Well, you know, after I set up this computer, what do I tell Isaac how to find it, you know? And so, like, nothing's very well documented and and we're we're sort of suspended between two different ways of doing things and you know the old way is not supported and the new way is probably incomplete you know like microsoft their first version of everything sucks so so this yeah. is just terrible so if anybody does this sort of thing and has any advice i'd love to hear about it in the comments what to watch out for do I need to worry about security here on a home network? Because who knows what Microsoft is going to do. Just like, can somebody ex external outside of the router find this computer and just, you know... I mean, I wouldn't care if they read the files. They don't need to be secure. <laughs> Download all my gameplay footage. <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't want them deleting stuff or putting malicious stuff on it. I don't know. What are the rules? How does it work? I'd love to hear about it. Something else confusing is the the computer that is destined to be this file server for us is right now a Windows 7 machine. And I've gotten conflicting reports on whether or not that can be upgraded. I know better than to try and share files between Windows 7 and Windows 10. I'm sure that's something that Microsoft claims work and won't. I mean, that's just, I'm going to assume that. Why go down that road? It'll just end in tears. And yeah. there are still, there's apparently you can still get Windows 10 for free. Maybe, kinda. So I'm trying to figure out like, like a year ago, people were still saying you could do the upgrade for free, even though Microsoft was saying it's for a limited time. And I wonder if that's still true. I know you can just install Windows 10 and not license it. Um, and then it has like a little, this copy of Windows 10 is not licensed watermark in the corner of the screen all the time. Yeah, but since this computer will sit in the closet, who cares? 
I mean, I w you know, yeah, you wouldn't want that on matter. your gaming. Yeah. So, I don't know. We're about to find out the hard way, the answers to all these questions. But if anybody has been through this, please tell me about your journey. I don't suppose sneaker net is an option? We considered it. It was actually, it really, it would really suck now because he's all the way up on the third floor and I'm on the second. And it's like, oh, wait, I forgot that file. Okay, I'll go back downstairs. Oh, wait, no, I... Do you have this file run back upstairs, back down again? Um, I, although, I do need the exercise that's actually just super <laughs> annoying. just about to say. <laughs> I do need the exercise, but I don't want to have the exercise while I'm trying to work. You know, come staggering back to my computer. <gasps> okay, now I'm going to do this work. This work that requires high concentration while my brain is shut off the oxygen. <laughs> while my body is shut off oxygen <laughs> to my brain to support everything else so but we'll be on the we'll be on opposite sides of a we'll share a wall so we'll be next door to each other at the new place so maybe sneaker <gasps> net is the way to you do could it make one of those one of those library like drop boxes right where you put the thing in and then Pneumatic like pneumatic tubes oh well i was just thinking like straight through the wall right but yeah right just yeah but it, i mean a lot of it is we you know, I sort of upload files one at a time as I fill in the images, and he's working on editing on his side. So, that would be really annoying to continually ha pass a USB stick back and forth. Yeah. I'm sure there's there's a way to do it. It's just, yeah, Windows doesn't doesn't understand why you would want to. Right. I mean, we can use SneakerNet if we need to, but... It'd be nice if we had a file. And it would also, the other reason I want to do this is I have all these drives on my computer and, you know, external, because, you know, you start collecting gameplay footage, that takes up a lot of space real quick. And yeah. so I've got all these backup drives and external drives, and I'm like, boy, it would be nice if, and if I could free up a few USB connectors on this machine. And just dump all that crap on just some crappy workhorse computer. Like, some crappy ancient, you know, 2010 computer. We've got one. It's 64-bit. That's all we need. It doesn't need to run Crisis. Right. Oh. Yeah, neat. All right. So... I guess that's the show. Is there anything else you want to complain about? Um, uh, no. Well, that's probably healthy. I could complain about things all night, but I shouldn't. So let's wrap this up. Thanks to everyone who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, the email is diecast at shamesyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye to Seamus' old apartment. second. All right, let's see what the blood pressure is now.
that is snug. I feel like I'm watching a slot machine, like, a, you know, or a roulette wheel. I'm just hoping for good numbers. <laughs> 167 over 106. Not super good. Uh, well, hopefully all those boxes will get you some exercise. <laughs>